Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by Hub24, Australia's leading provider of integrated platform, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for overall satisfaction and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. Hello and welcome to this series on delivering cost-effective advice with an entrepreneurial mindset. My name is Fraser Jack and in this series we hear from an amazing panel of entrepreneurs. Uh, First up is the money mentor Adele Martin uh, running a national business from Newcastle. Uh, Then we have Vince Scully from lifesherpa.com.au followed by Nicola Beswick from FMD Financial in Melbourne. Rounding out the conversation is Greg Newman, Head of Distribution from Hub24. This is the first podcast in a series of five, and in this episode, we start high level, and the panel discusses the evolving advice landscape uh, from where we've come from to how the headwinds have shaped where we are today, and how the difference between thriving or surviving is in the mental flexibility to see things with an entrepreneurial mindset. In episode two, we take a deep dive into Adele Martin's mindset. In episode three, Vince Scully tells us how he started a business by tacking the opposite way in the headwinds of uncertainty. Episode four is all about how Nicola Beswick is finding her way as an entrepreneur within an existing traditional practice. And rounding out the series, we hear how Greg Newman is working with many business principals to help them adopt an entrepreneurial mindset. For now, stay tuned as we kick off with the high-level discussion on delivering cost-effective advice with an entrepreneurial mindset. Thank you for joining me, Adele. Oh, thanks for having me. Now, we are chatting about entrepreneurial mindset uh, in the advice landscape, and uh, who better to talk to than you? Obviously, uh, we've had many, many conversations about this in the past, but I'm really looking forward to this particular one where we're recording it for everyone to listen to. Uh, let's, let, let's dive straight in. The, the advice landscape, where has it come from and, and where is it going and how do we overlay an entrepreneurial mindset? Yeah, so I... Uh, clocked up 20 years in advice last year and so let me tell you it is very different 20 years ago to what it is now and uh, yeah I mean when we first it blows my mind but we didn't have computers to log on to to, for fund manager information everything was on the phone Uh, we spent yeah it was SOAs when called SOAs they were a couple of pages and so yeah it was a very different world back then Uh, and um, but I think fundamentally it was still largely about people and so you know it still had that people element to it, um, which is very different to, you know, something like accounting, which is like numbers first, and then, you know, people sort of the afterthought. So yeah, definitely has changed and evolved um, over that time. And yeah, I couldn't have imagined how much so. So yeah, and I guess for me, you know, I got offered a job at a bank um, when I first was out of uni, and I, I didn't take it. I went down the power planning line, I wanted to understand it more, which, you know, for a 21 year old with, with a lot of money and, you know, perks to turn away from, but I knew I wanted to have a um, understanding. I just didn't want to be to doing sales. Um, and then, so yeah, went up that way, power planning. Um, yeah. At, at firstly, assistant, power planning, advisor, owner. I'm none for two with business partners. Um, and then, yeah, that brings us to now. <laughs> now, now I want to talk about this concept of, you know, the advice process as, as, as you went down that journey, obviously, you know, it was like, we've, 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 let's, lead into the fact it's always been a compliance led regime you know we need to make mm-hmm. sure we do these things and tick the boxes which is all fair enough because nobody wants to end up uh, end up on the wrong side of the the legislation uh 
But then again, if we think about consumers, consumers were um, consumers in many different um, you know industries. They were consumers in you know health and, and consumers in medical and consumers in groceries and they're, 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 they're consumers in all these different areas um, who all sort of took different paths over the last twenty years. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, how I, so I think we have forgotten about the consumer. I really think that we put so much friction in the advice process. So I think, imagine if we went to, you know, buy a house or buy a car. And before we've even done that, we want them to be ID'd and go find a JP and and print this thing out. I'm like, I don't have a printer. Why are you printing this out? And, you know, go find all this information about your superannuation and do this five thousand a budget that's like this long and like we put so much friction and you know in the advice process before they've even come to us a lot of the time which you know if we think about other industries there's no way they put all those hurdles in place and make it hard so um yeah i, I was talking to an, a a I solicited the other day and he said, oh, Adele, I don't envy your, your you know, financial planning businesses at all. He goes, I actually want advice. And oh, it just got too hard with all the insurance. Like, and so people want it. We just put so much friction sometimes because we haven't thought about the customer, you know, at all. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think we, we have a lot to learn from other industries. Um, and that's where I've gone for exploration and is to other industries. And, you know, I've worked with and I've invested very heavily in my um, myself and my brain in lots of different coaching here and overseas. Uh, and a lot of that time, it's not necessarily ideas that have come from other financial advisors. It's come from external businesses and the practices that they are doing and trying to incorporate that into what we're doing. Um, certainly, obviously, you've got to make sure you're, you're doing it legally and compliantly. No one wants to end up uh, in jail. Um, so, But there is definitely some things that we can do to make it easier for people to say yes to work with us. Yeah, we were talking earlier just off um, before we started recording about the value of financial advice and you mentioned and um, you know you mentioned this concept around instant gratification earlier just when you were saying um, you know consumers are outcome based they want things now. They don't want to wait, you know, like I want to buy a car, I'm going to wait it's going to take you 6 weeks of information and backwards and forwards and making sure this is the right car for you. Um, people want that instant gratification. And, and so, you know, having those small steps, if you like that, I mean, obviously we'll, we'll get into some of the stuff that you're doing in the, in the next episode, but having those small steps are amazing. Um, and, and, you know, other industries do that very well, don't they? Yeah. Let's, I think that's the thing. Let's see if we can have some wins early on for them. Like if we can give them that win, they get that little high and dopamine rush to, to keep going. So I often work, you know, with people in their twenties and thirties. One of the very first things we do is see if we can maximize their income. So I've got a, a script that they use that they can go back and, you know, use to get a pay rise. And so that process, you know, they get, they, a five, this, it just sounds to me, sometimes I work with a lady at the moment, it's been 13 years since she's asked for a pay rise just because she's never thought about it. No one's ever put it into her head or she's worried about what if they say no. So I've developed a whole process around that how to ask for a pay rise, what to do if they say no. And we do that early on so they can get that win momentum. Or we, another one we do is pick their biggest bill and help them negotiate it. So if they can say, you know, that that we do early on before we get to the look at your superannuation, that's something that's going to have a, you know, long-term, they can sometimes feel not that excited about it. So we can get some of these um, wins early on. It gets them motivated, excited, you know, to keep going. Yep. Now I want to uh, I want to pick on this uh, just because in this particular episode we're looking at the, the bigger picture and the evolution. Talk to me about other industries. You and I have spoken in the past about the you know personal trainers and health industry as a, mm. as a great model. What what industries have you uh, modelled off? I guess. Yeah, health is great. They're great for a couple of things. They do things really well on scale. So they've been. Um, they also are really good at community. People want to belong to something. Um, even more so in today's world where you know people can feel disconnected online. They want to belong to something. Um, and so you know that whole sense of your neighbourhood. You know, people used to belong to the neighbourhood. That's why that like local coffee shops are good because it's you know it's that community. People want a community. And so they've done that really well. And they've also done scale you know very well as well. So if I think about someone like as Michelle Bridges, for example, has she got people amazing results with you know with her um, challenges and stuff that she does? Her uh, yes, she has. Has she had to physically go around and train every single person? No, she hasn't. And so she's been able to impact the lives of you know hundreds of thousands of people without having to do it all. The other thing that they do really well is they gamify stuff. So they they measure, they gamify, they give them, you know, something like a challenge is a perfect example. You've got an end result. They're very clear about what the outcome is um, and, you know, then they've got some measurements and some, you know, things that they do along the way. So, yeah, 
that I think is, you know, having, and, and we can tie that to financial planning. What are we actually helping them to do? Where are they going to get to? What are some of the milestones we can do and tick off along the way? How can we gamify it and make it fun for them? So, you know, some of the things we could be able to do is, you know, what's, how, much of, how much percentage are they saving of their income? How does that compare to the average Australian? If we want to measure financial independence, where they want to, you know, choose how much they work, what's that number to them? How are they tracking along that? Maybe we could have a big rocket and every meeting we're updating their net worth. Let's like make it exciting, you know, a stretch something we're going towards. So yeah, there's lots of things that we can do to, to gamify it. Community. I'm a massive fan of community. I've got a free Facebook group. I've got paid groups. Um, you know, I'm a fan of, you know, um, community. Uh, um, I'm also, yeah, a fan of doing stuff on scale. So I found as an advisor, I was having the same conversations all the time. And I don't know about any other advisors out here, but by the time you say on the fourth time that week, explaining risk profile for the fourth time, you're not doing it as good as what you did at the start of the week. Uh, and, you know, especially with me, I've got two children under two. I'm sleep deprived by that the end of the week. Um, so um, I, I thought well, there's got to be a better way. So what I did was um, I've, rec- I, you know, I recorded my best version of it. And then I, you know, use that. So now before the risk profiling meeting, the clients are watching this video. Um, Before we talk about, you know, their goals, they're doing a goals exercise. So there's a way to make that onboarding experience really amazing for the client. Uh, And then they, you know, it's not tied to the SOA. They're getting stuff straight away. They feel educated, understood. Um, So, yeah, that whole, and I haven't had to have the conversation, you know, 50 times with them about budgeting or 50 times with them about setting goals. It's done once. It's done really well. They tell me I become their Netflix for the next six weeks. They they do that. And then the meetings are so much easier uh, because that bulk education, a lot of the, the stuff that's just you do over and over that's repetitive is done by the client. Um, and then you can spend more time you know, on coaching with them, on all the other stuff that adds value. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely lots of stuff we can learn from the fitness space um, in particular um, that we can bring in. Yeah, geez, I love talking to you. Um, you know, it, sometimes, when I'm, sometimes when I'm talking about the, this sort of stuff, we're talking about the evolution in the future, but you're talking about the past because you've already done it. I love it. One of the things I wanted to dive in there in the gamification space is um, you're absolutely right. Belonging is a really important standing for something, you know, having a, a, a just cause or something moral about what we're doing and why we're doing it. You know, the gamification, I love the levels concept. I um, I learned to, to gamify my age the other day. So I'm now turning, uh, increasing a level every year, not just uh, aging. Um, and, you know, like you're right, in, in the financial process, if you've got 30 things to do, then make it 30 levels and allow people to grow as they uh, as they get there rather than becoming a checklist yes. and becoming long and so, arduous. Yeah, something that I've started to work on is, and because I sometimes get advisors say, oh, millennials don't want to work with you long term. Well, that's just because you haven't laid out the pathway. You haven't said what it is, what they're trying to tick off. Uh, and so what I've done is I've sort of introduced this concept of like, okay, high school, these are the things that you need to tick off. One is having an emergency fund. One is creating a spending plan. One is being clear on your goals. One is doing your will. So I've got like this really clear high school. Then once you graduate high school, we go on to, you know, university diploma. These are the things you need to start to do. And that is pay off your personal debt, um, increase your super contributions. These are all the things you need to do in that, you know, uh, high school, uh, uni space. And then we do your master's in financial planning. Under your master's in financial planning, these are the things that we need to do. We need to start thinking about your legacy, what, you know, financial independence. Um, we need to start thinking about building wealth outside of superannuation, max, self-managed super fund, maxing out your super contributions. And so I've developed this really clear pathway that um, clients come in, they see the big picture, they know what you're working towards, they tick it off. Uh, and so that's been really a game changer because they know it's not a set and forget thing. They know what the next step is. Um, they're engaged. They want to tick them all off. So, yeah, I think that's the other thing um, that's important is having knowing that pathway. Um, the other thing I'm really big on, which I see other places, industries doing, is celebrating client wins. So I've become bigger and bigger at capturing client wins. So one of the things I start every meeting off with is I want to know what's a big win you've had, big or small, or what's a win you've had, big or small, since we've last met. Uh, it doesn't have to be money related, but it can be. Um, what's the win you've had? I explain to them the reason why we do that. Um, sometimes we can feel a bit demotivated. This gives us momentum to keep us motivated. So it's really important we do this at the start of every meeting. 
And then I go, okay, let's reflect on some of the other wins you've had since we start, first started working together. And then I've got all the other wins that they've ticked off. So I'm reminding them of the value that we give every single time we meet. I'm getting them excited and motivated. So I had this happen the other day where the um, lady goes, oh, I can't think of anything. Oh, if you did think, if you could think of something, what would it be? Oh, I've just paid off my debt, this personal debt she's had for ages. I'm like, amazing. So you've got an extra $3,000 a month now spare. She's like, oh, so like an extra 30 something grand a year now you've got to put somewhere else. Um, oh, yeah, that's incredible. I'm going to save this much interest. What do you want to do with this cash for now? Um, yeah, so, yeah, I think that celebrating the wins has been really big as well uh, and celebrating those milestones. So, yeah, that's definitely something that I've, you know, borrowed from other industries and have instilled into the business is celebrating those wins. Now, that has two things. What then happens from that is they then, you know, become your biggest advocates because they, like, are so excited and pumped. Then also a good opportunity for you to say, listen, I love helping people smash their goals just like, just like you. I would love to have all my clients just like you. It's a very natural conversation to say, um, you know, is there anyone else you know that I could help? Or would you mind spending 30 seconds and doing this Google review? Because I'd love, I'm growing my business and I want to help other people just like you. It's very natural fit to then ask for referrals, to ask for that Google review when you've been um, celebrating those wins. Yep. And celebrating your wins means that they can, you can celebrate the win with them and then you can encourage them to celebrate their win with their friends and family and talk it, start with the win and then obviously work the way back to um, to you helping them. But just before we, uh, before we jump uh, off this particular episode, um, I just wanted to talk about one to many and zero to many. Um, that's something that you've really embraced over the years. Yes, I'm a big fan of that Um, because it gives me the capacity to help more people. So I know there's only so much that I can do as one person. So it lets me help more people. And um, yeah, so I start, so it starts, it can be with your, um, so I started, I've got a program called My Money Buddy, uh, a self-paced program that people go through. So that is done at a very much a scaled level. I'm I'm very, you know, hands off um, with that. So, and, but then there's also other ways that we can incorporate scale. So as an example, you know, every quarter or every month, I'm a big fan of doing it monthly. Why don't you do a workshop or a training, which is just a webinar, but don't call it a webinar to your clients. Nobody wants to go to another webinar, call it a workshop or training for your clients. So um, you could be the person that drags someone else in that's an expert. So, you know, at tax time, I bring in the accountant to talk about how to prepare for your first tax return if you've got an investment property for the first time. What do you need to have? Um, you know, we have someone come in to talk about the federal budget. We have someone come and talk about estate planning for helping your elderly parents. You know, my clients are now going through that journey where they have older parents and they're starting to ask questions about that. Let's bring someone, you know, experts in on that. So I think that can all be done and meant to value without you having to do it all individually. So, yeah, I think that is another way we can add amazing value between review meetings for clients. So we can be the expert and talk on something or we can bring another expert and that could be something that we do every month. Um, now, this could also be something that then gets stored inside a member's area that they can watch back when convenient. So when someone comes on board, they've got all this training, all these these coaching calls, all of a sudden it's making your advice business and you know much more valuable because it's something tangible that they can see, they can get access to straight away. So it can't be just something that you record. It can be something that you actually you know, people log into and it feels valuable to them. They can watch them all. Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly, it's number one rule of scale, making sure you can record and send it out and allow people to, you know, many people to watch the same thing. Uh, Adele, thank you so much for being part of this very first episode. We look forward to jumping and catching you in episode two when we go for a deep dive into all the really amazing stuff that you've been doing. Yeah, you're most welcome. Thank you for joining me, Vince. G'day, Fraser. It's great to be here. It's fantastic to have you on. You've obviously uh, no no stranger to the XY podcast, so thank you for joining us again. But when it comes to entrepreneurs and mindsets around, uh, you know, the the landscape of financial advice, you're certainly one of the people I, I, that comes to my mind. Well, thank you for that, Fraser. Mate, I may not quite fit the XY demographic, but um, <laughs> certainly an advisor. Yeah, exactly right. So, uh, so you've uh, you know you, you've you've been uh, in advice a, a long time, and you've seen the traditional model and been part of the traditional model, um, and and then decided to think about things from a completely different mindset. Uh, and it, before you launch your existing business, which we'll get to a lot of the detail of that uh, when we when we get to the episode um, episode three on in this series. Uh, but before we get to that, let's. I wanted to chat to you about the landscape itself and how. Um, how far it's come, or I guess even how far it hasn't come. 
So Vince, tell us your thoughts on the the, the evolution or the evolving landscape of the advice, and and, and I guess we'll, we'll start in the past of where it's come from. So I think the history of advice has gone through three three phases. We had advice one one which was really product sales, where your typical advisor, and I'm sort of going back to the seventies here, where your typical advisor was largely a insurance or fund salesman dressed up as advice and that matured very quickly in the 80s into what I call advice 2.0 which was product sales dressed up as strategy and now I think advice 3.0 is finally become a a client-centric practice where everybody acknowledges that it all starts with goals and we need to be delivering a solution that meets those goals, stated or unstated. And we've seen huge changes over the last, probably the last decade or so since FSRA came in. And, you know, as older advisors transition out of the industry, um, we are seeing a complete change of that. And the withdrawal of the big banks um, in the last year or two, I think, is accelerating that. But I don't think this transition will be complete until we get rid of the vertical integration completely. We can't possibly di- divorce the product from the advice because almost all advice involves some product somewhere, even if it's the simple pay off your home loan and buy your wife flowers, which is probably the best advice we can give most clients. It still involves a, a home loan and telling someone that they should... Uh, you know, get the best rate doesn't really help unless we can actually help them do that. Sending them off to Canstar to get a better rate is not really advice. Yeah, I almost feel like uh, just inside of that product advice piece, there's almost uh, you know providing information or, or conversation around a product and then encouraging someone to implement a product probably two slightly different things if you're in the advice landscape, but they're not they're not separated within any of the acts. Yeah, but I, I'm not sure that you can actually, in practice, deliver a holistic advice piece of advice to a client without also solving the last bit. It's a bit like going to your doctor and your doctor going, well, look, Fraser, you've got cancer, you need to take some medication. Now go down the road to your pharmacist and negotiate which one and how much to take. Sure, you don't want your doctor taking commissions from the drug company, but to divorce the the prescription from the diagnosis, I think, does the consumer a disservice. Yep. Yep. Now, um, now one of the things I wanted to sort of tackle in this area is how other industries or professions, you know, work and trade and and have customers and clients and those sorts of things, and how financial advice or things that financial advice can learn from those other industries. So do you do you have a sort of look at other professions or, or industries and say, well, if they can do it, why can't we? Um, I'm not sure the vast bulk is actually all that different. As you may or may not know, I'm actually qualified as an engineer at university. And if you look at your typical engineer who you commission to design your building, he's obviously going to work out how much concrete you need and how much reinforcing you need to put in the pillars. And then you're going to commission a builder to build it to his specification. Sometimes he'll supervise the job, sometimes your architect will. But he'll be there to certify that the right amount of steel is in the in the pillar and to get your occupation certificate from the council. So as financial advisors, well, what are we doing that's different? If we're going to say, well, look, you need some some life insurance. Here's how much you need and here's who you should buy it from because that's the one that's most suited to your needs. I'm not sure that those two things are materially different. And to leave a consumer to their own devices, having told them they need half a million dollars of life cover, to then go to CanStar and choose the choose the cheapest one, we're actually leaving them in a worse position than if we said, look, the answer is you need half a million and it needs to have these features and here's the most effective way of buying it. Oh, and by the way, you should use your super to pay for it and here's the tax implications of that. I think once you remove the prescription from the diagnosis, you fail to deliver the advice the consumer needs. But we can fix structurally. There's a whole bunch of things that can be changed, and vertical integration is one of the biggest problems. 
because if you go to a an advisor that's linked to an insurance company, it shouldn't surprise you that more of the advice will favour that particular issue, be it notwithstanding. It's getting getting a lot better than it was. I've always uh, I've always thought the same thing. I've sort of thought to myself though, if you, if you go into a Toyota dealership and you want to buy a new car, they're going to sell you a Toyota. And, yep. and and that's fine as long as you're not expecting them to say what's the best type of car for you. It could be a Mazda, it could be a Mitsubishi, it could be a Toyota, uh, and then come up with the fact that it's a Toyota. Um, you know, just yeah, but, the- I, but, yeah, but I think the one thing you do expect them to do is to tell you, well, Fraser, oh, sorry, what you should expect them to be able to do, and that's where the dealership analogy falls down, is you should expect them to say, well, look, Fraser, you only drive 4,000 kilometres a year, therefore you should get a go-get membership. So assessing whether you need the product at all is part of the advice process. And whilst a consumer would maybe have a reasonable expectation that if you go to an AMP advisor, you might be more likely to get AMP product, it's less clear that they're going to get the advice that, well, actually, maybe you don't need life insurance at all. Yeah, that's right. And I actually think it's, um, it, 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 as a profession, it's a bit more like saying a doctor that works for Pfizer or one of the big medical company, you know, companies that is employed by them and, and, you know, gives you advice on what you should be taking would pretty much end up with a product out of the back of it. So it, it sort of makes sense from a profession point of view. And, but, um, but, you know, from a sales point of view, if you're talking about, you know, products that people wanted to purchase, um, then it probably makes more sense to just say, well, the, the labels on the top. You walk into a Commonwealth Bank, you're going to get, uh, and you ask for a home loan, you're going to get a Commonwealth Bank home loan. Um, you know that's that's the product on the on the top of the yeah. of the label. Well, you make that decision before you walk in. Yeah, but when you when you change the dynamic from I want a home loan, I'm walking into a home loan shop that says CBA on the on the door. That's a pretty clear analogy that the consumer is very aware that they're only going to get CBA products. Yeah, it's a little less clear when they walk into an Aussie home loan broker. Which is still fifty percent or forty five percent on the CBA. Yeah, um, that, that's right, and that's 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 and that's the vertical integration piece you're talking about. But but so just before we before we leave the comparison with other professions stuff, there, you know, if you go to a lawyer, you're almost always going to be told that you need legal advice. So I don't think the fact that you know if I'm selling hammers, most problems look like nails. And almost everybody, as a human, will naturally go, well, my, you need my solution. And that's another problem with uh, vertical integration. So if you go and see a, an advisor with your super fund, all they can tell you is super. So the answer to wealth accumulation is always going to be put more into your super. And by corollary, put more into my super fund. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think that's a peculiar thing limited to financial advice. Yeah, it's a problem with anyone who's selling a single solution. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, uh, before we before we move on to the individual episodes, I just wanted to talk to you about some of the headwinds that advisors are facing at the moment. There's obviously uh, been a lot going on um, with with exams and and mental health and issues around additional and changes and more and more um, legislation stacked on. But then some people, I think the advisors with entrepreneurial mindsets have sort of not worried too much about that and just got on with what they needed to do. What are your thoughts on yeah. um, I mean, my, the, my, the headwinds? My, yeah. my thought is that all change is good change and those who embrace it profit from it, those who resist it die. That's just a fact of life in any profession. So what what's really changed? Well, I don't think a lot has fundamentally changed from a regular perspective. Um, yeah, for your requirement to pass the exam. Well, the exam is really a demonstration that you understand the regulatory environment you're working in. You know when you should give a FSG, you know, what it should contain. So I really struggle with uh, the resistance to that. And I must admit, I'm sort of coming off on the wrong end of this, that by 2025, 2026, when the education requirements in, despite having four degrees and a whole bunch of other qualifications, including the chartered accountant, and doing this for 35 years, I'm actually not going to pay, meet the education requirements uh, without doing three more modules. So you would think, therefore, that I had an incentive to whinge about these things, because that does seem sort of unfair, and that's one of the criticisms laid at, laid at the door of the changes. 
you know, I think it is a good thing that it demonstrates to the public that everyone is qualified. And um, one of the things I've always worried about is people who fail the first exam or the first attempt, because many people took a number of goes at it. And so as a licensee, you know, if I have a an authorised rep that failed the exam, the day before they sat the exam, I could take a reasonable presumption that they knew what they were doing. The day after they failed the exam, I now have a piece of paper that says, actually, you're not competent according to the law. So can I continue to let you give advice or what other additional precautions do I need to, to take? Now, that may sound a bit harsh, and I'm not sure that many dealer groups took that view, but you know, I wouldn't want to be defending that one in court. So that's just one example, but there have been a, a lot of changes. The FDS is another one that keeps coming in for um, criticism. But actually, guys, this is an opportunity to say to your clients once a year, here's what we gave you and here's what you pay for it. Isn't that a wonderful deal? And if you don't have the confidence in your offering that you're scared of telling your client what they paid and what they got for it, then maybe you need to relook at your product offering or service offering. Um, that we, we very much see the FDS as a, as a marketing opportunity. It's an opportunity to reinforce with our members once a year what they paid and what they got for it and how much better off they are. Yep. So I think you know, we should be embracing this as an opportunity to demonstrate what we're doing. I mean, historically, we may have sort of done this in the annual review, but to make the juxtaposition of service and cost very clear in a document once a year where you're saying to your client that, you know, this is not your corner gym. We're not going to renew your membership without getting your explicit consent. Um, we're not going to build our business on inertia rentals. We want you to be happy and we want to be demonstrating that what we're doing is value for money. I don't see how anyone could object to that unless you've got something to hide. That's certainly right, leaning into it. I love the fact that you embrace change as an opportunity and, and, and that's exactly what entrepreneurs do. Uh, Vince, I just want to uh, thank you for being part of this first episode, but I really look forward to going uh, to a deep dive into your business as we get into the third episode. Thank you for having me, Chris. Thank you for joining me, Nicola, this week. You're welcome. Pleasure to be here. Now, we are talking about the evolution of the advice landscape and uh, specifically with an entrepreneurial mindset. So look, I thought we would start this particular episode of the conversation with you around that and just your thoughts on uh, on the traditional advice landscape and, and how we're able to come at it from an entrepreneurial mindset. I think one of the, the big things is knowing that we have to completely adapt to ever-changing things that we see. I think COVID is very much showing what we have to do and particularly when we look at the advice business we know that things are changing or have changed and we need to adapt from what was maybe the the more traditional generating funds under management to more of a looking at the different ways that we can service our clients and key aspects that may be part of what they're looking for so integrating key areas such as aged care and building wealth for the, the future generations, those kind of key areas are good for uh, new businesses to particularly adapt to and, and understand. Yeah, it's fair to say that, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurial mindset that I'm thinking of when I think of it is thinking about things outside the box, what are other industries doing, um, all those sorts of things. Because at the end of the day, oh, and also scale, which we'll get to in a second, but um, thinking about things from outside the box, you know, the, the, we do see other industries um, doing things that we can learn from. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on how other, you know, how, how advisors can learn from other industries? I think that's a really... I'm laughing a little bit because with my legal background and seeing the way that the legal profession has has changed maybe and is actually a profession, uh, that's one of the key things that I know is a hot topic in the advice space and that is something that we're all striving for in some shape or form. So looking at how lawyers and accountants became a profession and us as financial planners adapting to that is probably a really good comparison. And also looking at the the legal space where lawyers did very much specialise in key focuses. So you've got your family family law, um, 
intellectual property law, which is where I came from, your, your normal law from a property perspective and commercial aspects. So it's probably a good comparison there. Yeah, it is. And, and obviously those sort of things, as you mentioned, they are a profession and they're, um, you know, whether it's the medical or the legal profession, there's, they're very much a lot of specialists around. Um, they're doing those specific things and they refer out, everybody's referring other people off to specialists. Yes, they are. And it's building that really big trusted network of key advisors, not in the sense of financial advisors, but advisors in a broad spectrum of, of areas, I think is something that we're going to have to develop more and more and more. And this this love-hate relationship that maybe financial planners and accountants have, um, that's probably a key one there to to um, mention with that, that aspect. Yeah, because there's, there's probably pros and cons on both sides of that conversation too. There's obviously, you know, a traditional profession might have some great learnings, but then, you know, we have to sort of sit back and go, do we actually want to follow those professions down the line of doing it that way? Because that, you know, that might add, uh, I'm, I'm just imagining, you know, if there was a specialist that was super and a specialist for investment and a specialist for, you know, uh, for risk, then it could end up um, adding a whole lot of additional um, cost for mm. consumers to be able to come in and then, you know, we've got to start again with the needs analysis and start again with the, the process. And, you know, there's a whole lot of licensing and upfront costs that, that need to come with, you know, having a, you know, a specialist um, generalist sort of set up. What are your thoughts on whether we should follow down the, the lines of the, 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 the existing professions or whether we, you know, think about, think about something completely different? It's a good point you raised there. I think we as financial planners need to know a lot about key areas and be able to recognize certain aspects of a client situation, a bit like a GP, um, where you have a really big, broad knowledge of a whole range of different areas. And if we take the GP example, they know a lot about everything from a finance uh, a medical perspective. Some of them might know a lot more about financial planning than we, we thought, think, um, So getting that as a comparison and then having your real key areas that specialise in, that's a bit like GPs who refer out to, that may be what we see. But it's it's this real chicken and egg perspective when we particularly look at a cost perspective and when we're building a business and or in a business and we want to make sure that we're still servicing our clients but yet remaining um, profitable as well but it is that real kind of key area of how do you make sure that you're doing the best for for your clients but also getting that that cost piece under equation as well so that's a, a never-ending kind of conversation isn't it it's definitely one that i think the industry is grappling with at the moment and i mentioned scale because i think it's a it's a good p- part here it's about saying you know how do we provide clients with value at a at a price point that's that's relevant to them uh, i think i think you know one of the points you mentioned there that businesses do have to still you know understand what they're in business for which is you know helping their clients and that could be through investing or 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 you know looking at all different bits and pieces whether it's goals based or whether you you know you how you're coming at this whether you want to be an investment focused uh, analyst style of a, uh, of a, a planner or whether you wanted to be goals based or uh, whether you want to outsource certain areas um, I think it's really important to un- firstly understand where that sits and how, what your business is going to look like but um, yeah I think uh, we do sort of still have to understand that there are parts of business that still have to remain as you know revenue or income for the business and to become profitable how do we get then, um, you know, from the traditional areas of, you know, people coming out to retirement or retire- retirees to, you know, now, now looking at, a, a, say, a population going, how do we service the entire population of, you know, young families and all those sorts of things? I think making advice accessible and for cl- for people to understand a lot more about what financial planners do and how they can help in particular life stages. We're so um, driven to work with the, I guess, the older cohort of people, but they there is so many other people out there that are in so many other different situations that we just don't necessarily 
maybe think of or in that traditional sense. Um, We don't think necessarily about um, making sure that people that are in their 20s, 30s and 40s are actually setting themselves up right to be able to then um, live essentially that life that they want to live when they get to retirement. And I think we're we're starting to do that really well in the broad sense in the industry where there's so many um, businesses that really specialise in that area. But it's about that awareness and building that awareness within, I guess, the general public and and the community to be able to say, hey, it, it isn't just for the wealthy, it isn't just for the re- the retirees or the people entering into retirement it's about everyone and and building that that up for people to to really accept access at um at the the required points in time yeah i look forward to i certainly look forward to being a part of that movement trying to get uh, the messaging out there to consumers um and then, now Nicola, we're going to actually dive into when we speak to you in, in episode four of this series. We're going to we're going to find out a little bit more about your business and how you're bringing an entrepreneurial mindset towards your business. And it's very it's very easy for us to sort of talk about a small business, individual business, and say um, it's you know set set yourself a goal to be a specialist in the specific area. Um, but uh, but what we'll hear about when we get into your episode is a little bit more around how you're able to do that inside an existing traditional practice. Sounds great. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for being part of the series uh, and, and obviously this first episode and we'll look forward to catching you in, in episode four when we go into a deep dive into all of the things that you're doing in your business. Welcome to the conversation, Greg. Thanks, Fraser. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Now, do you want to give the listeners a very quick overview of you and your position at the moment? Uh, certainly. Um, I'm the head of retail distribution for Hub24 in Australia. Um, I have the pleasure of looking after most of the BDM interactions with financial advisors across Australia. So it's a great job. Wonderful, fantastic. And you're doing that all the way from the uh, the, the beautiful state of Western Australia. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, live in Western Australia for about 20 years and prior to COVID was commuting um, pretty well every second week to the East Coast. But but um, I have to say it's um, I've got itchy, itchy feet to get on the road again. I bet you, I bet you can't wait to get back across and, uh, and uh, catch up with people. Um, now, let's get into this. We're talking about the entrepreneur mindset. We're talking about uh, the current landscape around uh, advice and the somewhat traditional advice process and, and working out ways and ideas and um, concepts around uh, attacking this from an entrepreneurial mindset and being able to think about different ways to maybe uh, scale financial advice. What are your thoughts? Oh, we, our thoughts on this is the. There's never been a greater time than now um, for entrepreneurs and, and innovators to take centre stage. The uh, the landscape that exists at the moment, which we'll, we'll cover in a moment, is creating lots of opportunities and lots of challenges. Um, probably, unfortunately, a few people are seeing it as too many challenges and not enough opportunities. So we think the, the entrepreneurs are definitely seeing the world differently and they're really seeing opportunities that others are missing. Um, and we see that very much as the DNA of the planner, seeing the opportunities that others haven't seen. And it's historically been through, you know, regulation or, or how to interpret, um, uh, opportunities for portfolios. This group of people, um, are really quite courageous that we're seeing. Um, and with that, it's not really a, a reckless approach to, to taking the opportunities. They're taking really calculated risks to push their organizations forward. So they're seeing with this term, well, there's great, great opportunities to be different. Yeah, it is. It is a really interesting point you raise there, because often, um, often around that recklessness or creative opportunities, it can often be seen as you know we're compliance driven and we need to make sure that we've got all our ducks in a row, et cetera, et cetera, and so we just don't step outside the lines or we get we get our, uh, our, our a little wrap across the knuckles. Oh, absolutely. And I think what they're saying is they're they're seeing the same landscape as everybody else but they're not being limited by conventional thinking about it. So so really thinking, it's not that they're special, it's just that their mindset is very different. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's definitely it's definitely a mindset shift. Um, and of course, uh, you've managed to, to look at and, and think about some studies and surveys and stats and, and figures around this. And, um, you know, you speak to a lot of uh, planners around the country and, you, uh, and your BDM network speak to a lot of advisors, obviously, and you have these conversations all the time internally. Um, what are you seeing in the regards to, you know, some of the stats around? Oh, look, some of the statistics... Many people would know, but it's worth um, highlighting because they are moving um, uh, 
quite regularly. And the things that we've seen, you know, really since 2020 onwards with the big exits of, of larger financial services organisations, in particular the banks, um, has, you know, displaced a lot of advisors. But, you know, pleasingly, the, the, I think many would say they've found a better home than where they were before. So that change is, is, is pretty much um, complete um, from what we've seen. And the Australian consumer um, is very much occupied um, by the psyche of, of money management. And we know that from you know, ch changes through, through the last couple of years. The great thing that we're all seeing is the demand for advice is still there. But you've got this, this, this counter um, uh, force running, which is the, the number of advisors in, in the industry is, is steadily decreasing. Um, to, to really where we've seen in, in 2021, there was around about 17,000 advisors. And in 2022, we'll be down to around about 15,000, probably a little bit less than that. So huge demand and then a diminishing supply of advisors. And those advisors, of course, um, are being very much faced with, with less time um, if they don't get it right. And, and there's a, a real caveat there with not getting it right. Yeah, talk about, talk about the perfect storm. The uh, you know, the, the, I think what happened with consumers, in my in my opinion of this, is that at post royal commission there was sort of a uh, people didn't want to, or there was a lack of that supply. People weren't coming into financial advice. Then uh, then of course markets dipped, and we went through COVID, and all these sorts of things happened. Um, and and the the pendulum swung back the other way of all these people that didn't get advice in that period have now all sort of you know merged emerged as uh, potential clients of financial advisors and like you said it's been uh, you know uh, with with less advisors around it certainly makes an opportunity for those that are still there it, it does and and that's a very here and now um in the last couple of years approach but we're seeing you know a huge huge change in in the redistribution of wealth um which is which is this intergenerational wealth tra transfer that so many people are talking about and the scale of that, of some $3.5 trillion passing from one generation to, to millennials over the next you know, um, dozen or so years is just monumental. And I think from an advisor perspective, the profile of that future client is different. They're not baby boomers. They're millennials and they're, they're, they're different beasts um, to who they've dealt with before. Yeah, now obviously um, we've spoken to some advisors that are tackling or taking on that proposition. What are you seeing out in the, you know, out when you're sp speaking to advisors and planners about that exact topic, about them positioning their businesses for that? Yes, well, it, it's interesting. A lot of the advisors that we deal with are, are kind of um, used to dealing with 58-year-old couples. I guess I'm trying to, to be quite general in who they, who they are. The people that they're dealing with, I think advisors generally are struggling a little bit with who are these people? They've heard good and bad. Um, and we try and describe it to them. They, this is a generation of the digital native. They are wired. They, they've come into this world knowing, you know, technology inside and out. They have, you know, Facebook, Twitter accounts. They, they're, they're the people that uh, shows me I'm struggling to, to give it. Uh, examples of being a wired individual <laughs> as a 52 year old um, I should talk to my kids um, but th this is a wired generation and as a part of that there's very much this sense of it's not who they trust it's what they trust where do they where do they get validation from and that's a bit of a hard concept for for all of us because it used to be very much the individual relationship but there's there's so much research done about advisors and what's said online you know, where are you rated on Google, where are you rated on advisor ratings and the like. So they validate differently about who they're going to deal with. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, when you think about that validation or trust aspect to when consumers walk into, you know, and, and choosing within their own minds, choosing who and how they're going to deal with this and with the, the people. And I guess, you know, in the past it used to be you, there was a bank, it was a branch, it was trusted, you walked in, you spoke to them. Uh, that's very much not the case anymore. People have different relationships with their banks and they have they have different relationships with the the devices and the programs and the companies that they trust online. Oh, absolutely, and and the the millennials coming through, and, and just to to kind of cover them, it's such a broad band. Millennials, you know, can be someone that's um twenty six or forty one, or sorry, in all parts in between. So a conversation with a forty year old, forty one year old versus a twenty six year old is a very different experience. But the some of the attributes um, around this this group of people um, are that that you know this is a bit broad brush, but you know. They're somewhat nurtured and pampered through through 
their experiences, but they're really confident, ambitious, um, and achievement oriented. Um, so the, the, the opportunities there to, to find rapport with this group of people is something that we, we spend a bit of, bit of time, um, talking to, to, to our clients about, and they really value experiences. So even though they may research initially online, the human experience is one part of the total experience. Yep. Couldn't agree more. And, uh, and we were talking about probably those clients, but a lot of clients in that middle, uh, the middle Australia area, I like to call it. Um, advice affordability can be a massive issue for them or, or the perception of advice affordability, I should say, because often they're, um, you know, the, the actual advice is, is, is beneficial at the current price, but they just don't realize the value of that advice. Oh, absolutely. And I think the, um, the, the thing that they have fairly lofty expectations as well. And, and that is that, um, being such a connected group, they, in many cases, find it amazing that, that it's so hard to find a consolidated picture of them, which is their bank accounts, their credit cards, the investments they make. They probably have a, uh, an online share broking account. They probably have had their first managed fund purchase and then to come in and their insurances and like. And I think that, the needs of these people very much is consolidating um, a single view of them. Many are amazed that the industry has struggled so hard to get a, a single view of a client's wealth. You know, Hub24, I think, you know, we're very much at the, the leading edge of achieving that. But um, their needs are, are very much, show me my real position, um, and they're on a journey. They may not need a holistic plan. They will actually require iterative advice um, moments. And what we're seeing is advisors recognising you'll need a, a model to support opting in of, of various advice um, journeys. Yeah, one of the things that we've sort of discussed and, and had in mind for a long period of time is just that individual doing one thing provides clarity around that one little thing, but doesn't necessarily provide that clarity across a broad spectrum of different something over here and something going on over there and all those other things, which is what financial advisors have always done so well is bring you all that together. Um, Greg, I'm going to probably leave it there for this particular episode because we want to catch up with you in episode five of this five-part series. And I really want to start looking at, you know, obviously we've talked about what the current landscape is here, but I want to start diving into what some of the opportunities are and challenges for that matter uh, are within the advice practices that you're seeing. So thank you so much for being part of this first episode. Thanks, Fraser. Thanks, Fraser.